Whatever you like to turn this way and take out of your new sheet the, uh, the notes for today, which are this lurid green colour. Totally unmissable. And you'll find the, the outline. Um, it'll also be coming up on the screen. You'll find a pen there. You can, uh, you can write down notes or do a drawing. We may well auction artwork one day. You never know. Um, and just to, uh, to alert you to what's on the other side, if you want to follow this through, these are the discussion areas to, to look at in your small group this week. Or if you want to do that by yourself, please feel free. Uh, there are just ways in which you can follow up the, uh, the teaching for this morning. That's on the other side of the, um, uh, of the outline. And there's a little QR code there if you want to know exactly what I'm preaching on. In fact, if you could, you could sneakily get your phone out now and scan that QR code and follow exactly what I'm saying because the, uh, all of the notes that I've got here in my book are actually up there on the internet. You can find them. That QR code or that URL will give them to you and you can go away and use them to your heart's content. And um, I know a couple of people who have nicked them when they've gone preaching elsewhere. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, we're on a Sunday morning at the moment. We're looking at great missionaries of the Bible. Looking at people who were sent by God to do particular tasks in the process of bringing about his kingdom. And today, I want to look at John the Baptist. Uh, do you know, sometimes the most insignificant things seem to say a great deal. Um, I was out in the coffee queue, and uh, a little boy elbowed his way through this forest of legs to get somewhere. I don't know what it, where it was, and the chap I was speaking to saw this, saw this little lad pushing his way through. and said, cool, he's a man on a mission, isn't he? <laughs> and so he was. So we're considering the Bible's greatest missionaries. Now what that little lad had was a real sense of urgency that what he wanted to do was going to happen. And that's true of these people that we're looking at as missionaries in the Bible. There is a sense of urgency to bring about God's, to bring in God's kingdom, to, to bring about God's, uh, uh, the, the, the task that God had given them to do. And we're going to see that today in the life of John the Baptist. So you've got your Bible open, you've got your notes ready, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we believe now that as we come to look at your word, we're coming to look at the word of life. The word that brings spiritual life to people like us. And so Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth, that the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to you. And that here in this room... Heaven will touch earth, so that we leave here having had an encounter with you. We ask this so that your Son, Jesus Christ, will get the glory. Amen. So, we heard the story earlier on in the service. We will be referring to it uh, later on as we go through this morning's teaching. But let's ask, first of all, this question. What was John the Baptist's mission? And we find it there in the passage that we, uh, we've got in front of us. And the first thing I want you to notice is that his mission was to make much of Christ. Look at verse 6. There came a man who was sent from God and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. He was a man, an ordinary man. He wasn't an angel or something we can't identify with. And this is significant because as you read John's Gospel up to this point, we've been talking about things that are a little bit hard to get your head around. We've been talking about the light and the word. We've been talking about Jesus Christ as the creator of the cosmos. And so here, John, the author of the Gospel, brings us right down to earth with a bump. And he says, there was a man, and this was John the Baptist, an ordinary man. But he was also sent from God. And this commission defined all that he was and all that he did. His missionary activity, his communicating of God's love and grace and power, was a consequence of God's calling in his life. So what was he sent to do? Well, have a look at verse 7, because verse 7 tells us, he was sent to be a witness to the light. He was sent to tell people what he'd seen and heard. 
Now, when you have a witness in a case in court, a witness is expected to be someone who has seen the incident take place. Robbery or traffic accident or whatever. And when they give their testimony, they're expected to highlight the salient features of what they saw. What the robber was wearing, how far the cast was travelling or whatever. Yeah, what they had for breakfast or what they were watching on TV the night before is, is totally irrelevant. They have to stick to the point. And also with a witness, a witness has to speak about what they've seen. And that's how other people, especially, of course, the members of the jury, are going to be able to come to a reasoned view on what was happening. Now, in a very real sense, John was just the same. And when he did, we did, he's described as a witness here to the light, a witness to Jesus Christ, he was sent to see Jesus. He had to be there to see it. He was sent, like our witnesses, to highlight the most salient and significant features of Jesus' life. What is it about Jesus that makes him different? Well, John tells us, I baptise you with water, but he's going to baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he's there, he's commissioned by God to speak of what he's seen. John the Baptist was not a silent individual. He was a very well-known preacher, and people flocked to listen to this man. So John was sent by God as a first-hand witness to point to the awesomely glorious character of Jesus Christ. This means his life's task was to make much of Jesus and conversely make little of himself. In a very real sense, we're called to do the same. We're called to be witnesses to what we've seen and heard. I was so pleased that our two friends who gave their testimonies this morning, who talked about what God's been doing in their life, just spun the story about things they'd seen and heard. We are all called to bear witness to the light. We're not called to try and shine by ourselves. We're called to bear witness to the light. Now, of course, some of us are particularly effective in witnessing. And the Bible gives such people the label evangelist. We're all called to be witnesses, but some of us are particularly appointed or anointed by God as evangelists. We're able to talk to folk about where they stand spiritually, and it's not an embarrassment to us, it's not difficult. But we're all called to be witnesses, to say what we've seen and heard. And that was what John was called to do. He was called to make much of Christ. There's the the passage. There was a man sent from God, his name was John, and he came as a witness to testify concerning that light. Not only was he called to make much of Christ, he was also called to be the person through whom believing takes place. In verse 7, so that through him all men might believe. It's very interesting that we have that word believe here. It's the first time in John's Gospel that the word believe is used. Actually, it's used 98 times. There are 97 to come if you read through the whole of the Gospel. So believing is a major purpose of John's writing, John the author's writing. Don't forget, of course, we've got two different people here. We've got John the author who wrote the Gospel, and we've got John the Baptist. They're different characters. And John the author is writing about John the Baptist. By the time John the author was writing, John the Baptist uh, had died. The world will not be able to believe unless there are witnesses. And in just the same way, John the Baptist was sent as a witness so that people might believe in the one he was pointing to, and that is Christ. And we, amazingly, are called to be people through whom believing takes root. Through whom God's Holy Spirit reaches hearts that are hungry for spiritual reality. And you can use ordinary people like us. And we're called to be that. Verse 7. So that through Christ, all men might believe. So John's mission was to make much of Christ. It was to be the person through whom believing takes root. But it was also to make nothing of himself. Look at verse 8. John himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
Not only does John the author tell us that John the Baptist was not God's light, but John the Baptist says so himself. And it's fascinating how John the Baptist had to tell people who he wasn't. Look at verse 19. This was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He didn't fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that tells us that the Jews in Jerusalem, the, uh, the theological bigwigs, they felt it necessary to interrogate John, to send someone to ask him what he was doing. What is this ministry you've got? You've got? Why do you baptise people for repentance? We know that you can be baptised in order to be admitted to the, uh, to the Jewish family and to the Jewish faith, but you're baptising for something different. Because John was baptising people for repentance, and so they sent people to investigate what was going on. Now, other Gospels tell us that at this time, John the Baptist's influence was huge. Matthew, for example, he talks about the crowds who just flocked to hear him. And, and, and Luke... He retells a conversation where people actually thought that John was the Messiah. But what did John himself say? Well, if you turn over to chapter 3, don't feel you've got to do it because I'm just going to throw it up on the screen there. He said this, You yourselves bear witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. And the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. In other words, in, in, a, in a wedding ceremony, there would be an announcement that the bridegroom is on the way at the beginning. And that was the cause of rapturous joy. They, they clap and they make a whooping noise, you know. And then the, the bridegroom would arrive. And the uh, and John is saying, I'm like that. My joy is complete because the one who really matters, Jesus Christ, has arrived. And so what must happen? He must increase. But I must decrease. John's mission in this world was to pave the way for Jesus Christ's arrival. And my friends, in just the same way, we are called to pave the way for Christ's arrival in the hearts and minds of the people where God has placed us. There are few things more thrilling to know than you're part of the chain that leads someone into full faith in Jesus Christ. John was here. John came. John the Baptist to pave the way for Jesus Christ. That was his mission. Okay. Well, we've, uh, if we've observed that from the scriptures, we now need to ask the corresponding question. If that was John's mission, how did he go about achieving it? What did he do to make this happen? Well, first of all, of course, we know he baptised people. We happen to be a Baptist church. And we don't baptise people because we're a Baptist church. We baptise people because it's in the Bible. And there are many, many other churches in, in town and around the country who take the biblical uh, instruction to baptise adults on their profession of faith very seriously indeed. And that's where, we, that's where we stand on this issue. We are following what John did and what the early church did after Jesus' instruction to them uh, at the end of his ministry. But just look at what John said about his baptism. This is John the Baptist, not John the author. Verse 26. I baptise you with water, John replied, but among you stands one that you don't know. You haven't seen him yet. He's one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And that's a very telling image, because when you went into a house, uh, particularly a middle class house in first century Palestine, the first thing that would happen to you is that a servant would come and he would take your shoes and wash your feet. And the sh servant's job, as you sat down and made your feet available, was to untie your shoes and take them off. Now John is, and that was considered to be the, the lowest of the low. You couldn't get a much more menial job than doing that. Now John is saying here... I'm not even qualified to untie his sandal laces, let alone take them off. You think I've got a great ministry. You crowds are flocking to hear me. You ain't seen nothing yet. This one who's following me, this Christ, 
He is so much greater than I am. And whereas I baptise you merely in this water here, he's going to baptise you. In fact, if you look at Luke's Gospel, John says he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, the definite article, the word the, is not there in that verse. John says to his, his, his inquisitors, he will baptise you with Holy Spirit and fire. Not any old spirit, but a spirit that comes directly from God. And there'll be something like fire that's associated with that. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And let me just say a little, uh, little foot, give you a little footnote about this word baptise, which you can jot down if you like. It was the ordinary word for to plunge or to dunk. So, in the same way that we know um, people adopted different names in the Bible, like... Um, there was one man who was a real encourager, and he was called the son of encouragement, Barnabas. We looked at him last Sunday when we were thinking about Saul of Tarsus. So here it's likely that John's name was actually a nickname. He was John the Dunker, or John the Plunger. And uh, uh, that was how he was known. Because as a result of his ministry, people would always be baptised. That's what characterised the man. That was his method. That was his way of saying, look, a spiritual change has taken place. And it was in line with God's will and purpose. And Jesus Christ instructed us to do the same. We've been doing it ever since. So he baptised people. But he also preached. He proclaimed. He announced. He preached in a very similar way to probably to what I'm doing now. Now we know that the word to preach has a wide variety of meanings. It means to announce something, it means to proclaim something. When a a, a battle had been won on the battlefield and a messenger was sent back to the town or to the city to say that we've won, he would proclaim, he would preach the good news. And that's what we've been called to do as Christians. And John preached repentance. A change of heart that results in a change of action. And all the time pointing people to the one who was to follow him, Jesus Christ. And my friends, you know that I and Carl and Neil and the others who preach here, that is our passion. It's to proclaim, to announce, to communicate as compellingly as we can what God is doing and what the scriptures say. That's why we so often focus on the Bible. Why I believe it's imperative that we we systematically expound God's word. Even the bits that we find hard to understand. Although I'll tell you something, my father was a preacher. And I remember there was one really tough verse that he was preaching on, or it was in a passage one Sunday Sunday morning. And we got home at lunchtime and I said, Dad, you didn't say anything about verse 17. And he looked at me and he said, no, he said, we're on thin ice, skate fast. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Have you ever been vexed by the apparently self-serving or self-exalting words that come from some Christian figures? Because if you have, you should be. What bothers me sometimes is the way in which some some preachers, not all by any means, but some some evangelists, TV, internet preachers particularly, or conference speakers, or even Christian musicians, speak about Christ but subtly commend themselves. They use their Christian platform to advertise their own prowess or to make money rather than to glorify Christ. And the message sometimes that I'm left with when I log off the website or turn off the program is look at me rather than look at him. Do you ever feel that? Because I do. I was reading about another Christian leader, or the reading and writings of another Christian leader who was concerned about this, and he put it this way. A discerning person, quote, would probably complain that many of, the ser- many of the sermons are deficient in solid instruction, biblical exposition, and scriptural argument. They are flashy rather than fleshy. They are smart rather than solid. They are entertaining rather than impressive. He will point to rhetorical discourses in which doctrine is barely discernible and brilliant harangues from which no food from the soul can ever be extracted. 
that was written in 1890. And my friends, would you pray that every man or woman who puts their feet on this platform to communicate God's word communicates it in such a way that he receives the glory and we don't. My prayer is that you will hear his voice and mine will only be the voice box. And that was John. I want you to see Christ and forget all about me so that he's the one who receives the glory. John preached. So, should we just do a quick scamper now over what it was that John preached? Because Luke chapter 3 tells us, you can turn to it if you wish, it's uh, it's, uh, page 1029 there, I've given you the page number. You see, when John was preaching, the crowds came to him and Luke records how they said to him, what shall we do, John? You see, his preaching had a so what clause. They knew that God wanted them to change their lives, to repent, to turn around. And let's be careful not to misidentify the groups of people to whom John the Baptist was preaching. They were not these secularised, unbelieving non-Jews. These were the card-carrying, Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping people of his day. The the people we might regard as churchgoers, people would be here this morning, and John is calling them to repentance. People who travelled miles to hear this preacher and see people baptised actually found their own hearts being impacted by the Holy Spirit. And they said, what shall we do? My friends, when we ask that question, Lord... What shall I do? It often opens the floodgates of God's blessing. So what was John's so what clause in Luke chapter 3? We'll look at verse 11. The man who has tunic, two tunics, should share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. So first of all, he's telling us to be generous with our possessions. And selfishness was as much a problem then as it is today. If you have a surplus, if you discover someone in need... Help them out. I love the way on that little cat video, the man said, well, we could, we could save the extra money we found, but actually we've decided to give it. And I'm sure their church benefited as a result. You can't wear two coats. Then also in that chapter, we notice that he tells people to be honest with their dealings. Tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they said to John, what should we, do? what should we do? And he said, don't collect any more than you're required to do, he told them. Of course, you probably know that tax collectors were the lowest of the low. They were regarded as defectors, particularly if they were Jews. They were regarded as people who had defected to Rome, and now they were being used as Roman stooges to collect taxes. Uh, And and they were robbers, often in it just for their own ends. That's why Jesus' uh, Jesus' incident and and him changing around the life of Zacchaeus was so remarkable that Luke, Luke wrote it up later in his Gospel. Let me tell you a a true story. A man wanted to rob a downtown Bank of America. And so, see, so the paper records it tells us, he he walked into the branch where he wrote on a piece of paper, this is a stick-up, S-T-I-K-K-U-P, put your money, M-U-N-Y, in this bag and handed the bag. Oh, he had the bag on it, on his, uh, in his pocket. But while he was standing in the queue, waiting to give this note to the teller behind the, uh, behind the barrier, he began to worry that someone had seen him write the note, and they might call the police before he reached the teller at the window. So he left the Bank of America, and he walked across the road to the Wells Fargo Bank. And after waiting for a few minutes in the queue in the Wells Fargo Bank, he handed the note to the teller. Now, she read it. And surmising from the spelling errors that he was not the brightest button in the box, told him that she could not accept his stick-up note because it was written on a Bank of America deposit slip. And he... Re- <laughs> 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 That's true. And he would either have to fill out a Wells Fargo deposit slip or else go back to the Bank of America. And so looking rather crestfallen, the man said, OK, and he walked out the bank. The Wells Fargo teller called the police who arrested him a few minutes later while he was waiting in the queue at the Bank of America. (laughs) Would you believe it? It could only happen there. eh? (laughs) These tax collectors were crooks. And, And John is saying, be honest in your dealings with people. 
And then I noticed in Luke chapter 3 that, uh, that John the Baptist said, you just need to be content with your income. And how contemporary is a, a message is that? Some soldiers asked him, what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money, verse 14. Don't extort money and don't ex- uh, accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Soldiers in that day were known for their extortion. They had the muscle and they had the weapons. And they could easily issue threats and put people under pressure. They were using violence and extortion to get money. And John the Baptist is saying, look, there needs to be a change of heart, leading to a change of action, to be content with your wages. My friends, just looking down those three, are there any issues that we need to deal with? You may have come here this morning expecting to hear some uh, wonderful sermon about the glory of Christ. And my prayer is you will see the glory of Christ in this. But what God's saying to you now is you need to look at your bank balance. And make sure that your dealings are fair. You need to be generous with your possessions. That's what John preached. And people flocked, flocked to hear him. But you know the one thing he did that I want to finish with is this. He pointed, pointed people to Jesus Christ. Verse 29. Oh, we're back in John 1, sorry, I'll read it to you. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one that I meant when I said, a man comes after me who has surpassed me because he existed before me. The reason I came baptising with water was that he might be revealed in Israel. This is the one And my friends, I don't know why you came to church this morning. You may have come out of tradition or out of habit. You might have come because somebody twisted your arm and you couldn't find a decent excuse to say no. That doesn't matter. God knows you're here. And the one person he wants you to see above all others is his son, Jesus Christ. Because he's the one who changes our lives. You see, believing is a mind and a spirit experience. I believe with my mind. I give assent with my mind. And that's something that I find enormously comforting with the the, the message of the scriptures. That actually satisfies the intellectual inquiry of the inquiring mind. Some people will come to me and say, well, surely philosophy and science has disproved Christianity. Nonsense. It, It requires more faith to be an atheist than it does a Christian. Because as a Christian, I've got something to believe. As an atheist, I've got nothing. (coughs) Only what I see around me. And I know many people who have started from a position of atheism or agnosticism. And said, look, said to themselves initially, but kind of God eavesdrops on this sort of thing. If there is something else out there, I want to find it. And they've come to a point after looking at the Bible, looking at the life of Christ, seeing the wonder of this man's personality, the sacrifice of his death on the cross, realising that actually he died for me. And they give assent with their minds. Many of us, I know, are in that position. But not only do I give assent with my mind, but when I give assent with my mind, God ratifies that assent by giving me his spirit. As we come to faith, so God invests his spirit in us. That's the fire that John spoke about. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And yes, there may be some very wonderful particular experiences that you're going to associate with that phrase. But have no question, when you come to faith, God's Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. He may want to do a work in you so that so the filling of the Spirit is, is something that's developing day after day and there may be, as I say, many wonderful experiences that just crystallise that for you.
But have no question, my friends. When God is at work in your life, he does it through his Holy Spirit. Jesus came to baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the mission of John the Baptist was to tell us that was going to happen. Now finally, there's one huge difference between John and us. He could only speak about repentance. I can tell you about forgiveness. He could only speak about turning away and changing your lifestyle. What I can tell you, because we're this side of the cross, is that when God forgives, he forgives completely because Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice for your wrongdoing and for mine. The cross has now happened. Jesus has paid the price. And I'm going to suggest now that we have a few moments of quiet reflection. And it could be that there's something in your life that needs to be repented of, as John was preaching. It could be there's somewhere that while I've been speaking, God's been putting his hand on your life. He's just pointed out something in you and, and you've had to say, yeah, Lord, I know. I know that's you speaking to me. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do business with God now. We haven't got the baptistry open. I can't say you can be baptised straight away. But if that's the case, if you would like to be, let me know and we can arrange it. Or it may be something more personal. Let's just bow our heads in a moment's prayer. Father, you've heard the prayers of my friends. You've heard what we've been saying to one another. You've heard, Lord, the cries of our hearts. And we thank you that you hear and respond. Lord, would you complete your work in us? We lay ourselves open before you. Father, fill us with your spirit, we pray. Some of us are particularly hungry for you right at this moment. And we ask that by your spirit you will touch our lives and fill us anew. Fill us afresh. So that we may know personally a new sense of the glory of Christ and the one whom we're following. Amen. My friends, if God has spoken to you particularly while we're singing our final song, can I suggest you just come and stand over in our prayer zone and then we'll go and pray together for a few moments. We won't keep you long. We're going to stand and sing together and we're going to take up our offering. And if God has spoken to you particularly, just go stand over there and then we'll come and pray with you.